What is the most valuable, important car in history? You would come close if you guessed a Deussenberg SSJ, or the Ferrari 250 GTO, being the most expensive car ever auctioned. However, I'm talking about something that I consider even more important and more valuable. I'm talking about a car that completely rocked the world of motorsports in a way that had never been seen before. I'm talking about the Mercedes-Benz 300 SLR. The year is 1955. The now two-year-old World Sports Car Championship has been won twice, that's both times, by a Ferrari. Mercedes-Benz entered the competition for the first time with their newest car, the 300 SLR. The SLR was derived from the W196 Formula One racer, an icon in its own right, which recently sold for almost $30 million at auction. The SLR had a 3.0 liter inline 8-cylinder engine that made 310 horsepower and was capable of pushing the car to over 180 miles an hour, easily making it one of the fastest cars in 1955. While the engine was in the front, the hood was extremely long, so it was technically a front mid-engine car. This meant better weight distribution across all the wheels, which improved handling and control on the track. Another feature of the engine was that it was canted about 33 degrees to the passenger side, which created a signature bump on the hood of the car. This was done to minimize the space that the engine took up, and it improved aerodynamics. One of the most interesting things about this engine is the mechanical direct fuel injection. The injectors were derived from the high-performance DB601 V12 engine that was used on the Messerschmitt Messerschmitt that was used on the Messerschmitt BF109E German fighter during World War II. The SLR was also extremely light. It was made of electron, and that's not what goes around an atom, nerd. I'm talking about the ultralight magnesium alloy that was used for the SLR's bodywork. It's spelled with a K, so it's awesome. Using Electron as opposed to other materials limited the SLR's dry weight to only 1,990 pounds. Nine of these super light chassis were built in total, two of which were developed into a coupe version of the car, but we'll get back to that later. The SLR was extremely strong in the power and weight department, but where it lacked was braking. The Jaguar racing team had recently developed advanced disc brakes in coordination with the tire company Dunlop. This allowed Jaguar's car to decelerate much faster than the SLR, which was still using drum brakes. However, these drum brakes weren't terrible either. They were actually too large to fit on the 16-inch tires, so they were mounted further towards the center of the car. Brakes like these are called inboard brakes. There was also an added wind brake, which could be raised to increase drag, similar to what we see in the McLaren Senna, just much less advanced. Mercedes-Benz technological advances, combined with some of the best drivers in the world, made the SLR an extremely strong competition car. Sterling Moss and Dennis Jenkinson drove the car to victory in round three of the 1955 World Sports Car Championship at Mille Miglia, a 1,000 mile race that stretches from Bescia all the way to Rome. Moss also won the RAC Taurus Trophy in Dundrad, Iceland, and the Targa Florio in Sicily, which gave Mercedes-Benz enough points to finish first in the SLR's first ever championship. However, the SLR's era of dominance was a short one. In round four of the championship, at the legendary 24 Hours of Le Mans, something tragic happened. If you know anything about automotive history, you probably know where this is going. It was around lap 35 of the race, and the lead cars were beginning to pull into the pits. Jaguar's driver, Mike Hawthorne, had been signaled by his team to stop and refuel in the next lap. Hawthorne passed Austin Healey driver Lance Macklin, who moved to the right to allow him to pass. There were no deceleration lanes before the pit stops in those days. The drivers would have to slow down on the track and then pull into their spot. Hawthorne began to slow his Jaguar, but Macklin was taken by surprise because of the advanced brakes on the Jaguar. Macklin slammed on his brakes, and his car ran into the dirt on the right side of the track. Then, most likely because of the uneven driving surface, he lost control and his car veered out into the path of Mercedes-Benz driver Pierre Levey. Levey's front right wheel ran over the left rear portion of Macklin's car, which acted like a ramp and launched the Mercedes-Benz car into the air over an earthen protective berm and into the crowd of spectators. Levey was thrown from the car onto the track and was instantly killed. The SLR's body essentially disintegrated, throwing the heavy engine, transmission, and other debris directly into the crowd of onlookers. When the debris hit the ground, the fuel exploded, and due to the high magnesium content of the electron bodywork, the car ignited. It burned for hours. 
83 spectators were killed, in addition to the driver. Macklin's car hit the left barrier, and he was able to get out of his car and get over the berm to safety. Hawthorne had pulled into the pits, but was immediately told to get back into his car and drive to safety by his team, who wanted to get him away from the confusion. Mercedes-Benz's other driver, Juan Manuel Fangio, was in another SLR behind LeVay, and barely escaped the carnage, missing other cars by only inches. The crash remains to this day the deadliest accident in motorsports history. So what went wrong here? For starters, the Le Mans circuit had remained unchanged since 1923, a year when the racers had only been going around 60 miles an hour. In 1955, the cars were going over 170. Additionally, the only barrier between the crowds and the track was a four-foot earthen mound, which LeVay's car was able to jump easily. However, most obviously, there were no deceleration or acceleration lanes to or from the pits, and there wasn't even a wall between the pits and the track. The drivers were expected to stop in the middle of the track and essentially pull to the side to refuel, all while cars flew past them at over 150 miles an hour. The electron bodywork on the SLR also made the car burn extremely hot. Magnesium burns at over 5600 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 3100 degrees Celsius. The colliding race cars narrowly avoided several parked cars in the pit stops. Jaguar driver Duncan Hamilton, watching from the pit wall, recalled, the scene on the other side of the road was indescribable. The dead and dying were everywhere. The cries of pain, anguish, and despair screamed catastrophe. I stood as if in a dream, too horrified to think. In the aftermath of this horrible tragedy, several countries, including France, Germany, Spain, and Switzerland, banned all forms of motorsports. And Mercedes-Benz, after winning the championship, retired from racing. France lifted this ban on September 14th of 1955, and placed new regulations on racing safety. Other countries soon followed, but Switzerland never did. To this day, motorsports in Switzerland is prohibited in all forms except for time trial events and electric cars, such as Formula E. The Le Mans track was also improved to increase safety. Deceleration lanes were added to the pit stops, and new terraces were built for spectators, which were separated from the track by a wide ditch. Racers such as John Fitch, who witnessed the crash, became advocates for increased track safety and regulations. He, along with two other Le Mans contenders, retired from racing the same year. Macklin also retired after being involved in another crash in the very next round of the championship. In the end, however, none of the drivers were blamed, and the fatalities ruled to be caused by insufficient track safety measures. The 300 SLR marks an important point in automotive history. It represents improved racing safety measures and awareness as well as a reminder as to what happens when they are ignored. The few surviving SLRs have been locked away by Mercedes in either their corporate museum in Bad Cannstatt or one of their 11 classic car vaults. The rich history of this car, combined with its unrivaled design and beauty, makes it one of the most valuable and important cars in history.